Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with author Karma Sad and Master Joshua. Karma is the author of Surviving Master Joshua, the BDSM memoir of an unfaithful wife, while Joshua is a dominant figure in this book. Master Joshua is a pansexual, polyamorous, pro-dom. He leads a leather tribe, and when they met, he was battling accusations of rape and abuse. Master Joshua was the intended subject of her story as a journalist for a conservative outfit. Now, under a new name and a new lease on life, she speaks, as he does as well, about emancipation, freedom, and truth, and so much more. Enjoy this interview. The way I want to start this out here is, just kind of give me a background a little bit. I mean, I know what I read on paper, but just kind of give me a background. What exactly your your what what, what exactly your orientation is? What 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 you do? Okay, who goes first? Me. Yeah. Okay, I'll start. For I am married with two kids, not to Master Joshua, and I am a sex slave of Master Joshua. So uh, I. One of the things I focus on in what I talk about is the possibility of having multiple relationships at the same time and then being healthy relationships and corresponding with each other well, building off each other. Another part of, of uh, what I talk about is uh, the, the backstory, which is kind of the topic of my book, Surviving Master Joshua, the BDSM memoir of an unfaithful wife. Uh, I met Joshua as a journalist. And I was uh, working for a conservative outlet at the time, and I was following the story. And uh, rather than uh, being uh, the subject of my story, uh, our affair became the subject of the story. And rather being, uh, rather than being an article, it became a book. And uh, there was a lot. Uh, it was during the Me Too uh, period when the Me Too was in its uh, height. And uh, Master Joshua was dealing with uh, sexual abuse uh, accusations, and I was a reporter on his trail. Uh, <laughs> and uh, despite that, or maybe because of that tension, uh, we came to love each other, but we're, there were so many um, tension points. There were so many opposing uh, situations, right? Married plus kids from a vanilla world knows nothing about BDSM, meets a uh, professional dominant facing accusations, and then a whole series of conflicts unfolds. So the backstory is kind of juicy. Um, <laughs> uh, so those are the things I speak about usually, and I also, it's also important for me to highlight the aspect of BDSM being related or part of the LGBTQ community, as in uh, leather or in, and kink in general are a sexual orientation rather than a uh, hobby, let's say. Mm. And they deserve the protection of um, that sexual orientation gets because uh, I got fired over, not directly over my involvement, but I think my involvement has something to do with it. I got fired from my job as a conservative reporter in the end. Uh, not that that's something I want to focus on on this interview. Because uh, it's in the book? Because <laughs> it's in the book and, and, it's, uh, and because uh, I might get sued if I talk about that too much. Um, but it kind of led me to think that if, there was, if it was a transgender issue, I would have been uh, much... Um, it w might have not evolved that way. Let's put it that way. So I'm curious with the story here, did this story save your life? Is this something that you had no idea was going to become and manifest the way it did, but you're thankful that it did happen because it, 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 it opened up a whole new doorway into your world? Totally. Perfect. Couldn't say it better. <laughs> did you know prior to going into this story that there was issues that you were working on or was all of this unlocked? in the process, kind of a subconscious key was used to unlock something you might not have had your finger on at the time. I knew I had an inkling or an interest or a curiosity or uh, something different about me in regards to sexuality and sexual identity. However, um, I was taught to, I mean, we all are, right? Repress and correct it, right? And I did not think uh, over time, I, I just... Kind of 
to sit down. And uh, when Fifty Shades came out, uh, Fifty Shades, in my opinion, is uh, not good literature. <laughs> And it didn't speak to me as a uh, literal, uh, as, as literature, but it did kind of like open something in my mind. And after that came a whole uh, slew of very good literature, actually, that focused on, uh, on erotica and, uh, and uh, BDSM and power exchange. And, and there was something fascinating in that for me. So I used to think, uh, I used to think that just came out of the blue. But I have to admit that before I picked up this topic, and I, t I chose it. I mean, I said, I want to cover some more risque stuff. And somebody in the office said, I got a number for you. Uh, uh, then it just, uh, through all these interviews, these podcasts that you, we've been doing, I, I came to, to understand that I've been looking for it for a long time before. I just didn't assume it was real. I thought it was fiction. <coughs> 50 Shades, Vampires. <laughs> Uh, werewolves, millionaires. I didn't think it was something people like uh, me and you have access to within our city. I'm curious with, you know, because I know there's, there's a lot of different lifestyles that people subscribe to. And the thing that I've always thought about is, you know, there, there's a carnal nature that goes into it, and then there's an emotional nature that goes into it. So you are still married and, you know, have a family and all that, correct? Correct. Okay. So how does that ha how does that work emotionally? How how is that how I guess my question is how how does one like you successfully pull off something where you have kind of a dual life that requires both a carnal nature and an emotional nature? How do you take those hemispheres and make them work so that they're in a healthy way so that you and your partner and everybody else involved has a very good, satisfying, healthy ride along the way? First, it took a lot of work, a lot of practice. You don't walk into this knowing how to do it. Uh, you develop the skills to do it as you go along. So one thing, it is uh, having love be more powerful than the obstacles you encounter because the obstacles you encounter are terrifying. And... Before you cross it, it they seem uncross. Before you cross that that bridge, that that valley of death area, it seems impossible to cross. It's almost like there's a difference between reading the literature and the knowledge, and then actually experiencing it. Because it's like everyone has a good plan until something bad happens, and then everything goes out the window. Because uh, emotions and thoughts are hugely different. And I think the other aspect of it is uh, having partners who place the relationship above uh, the terms of the relationship. I, you know, Master Joshua stuck with me even when the going got tough. And the same with my husband. He stuck with me even when the going got tough. And that was key to, to all of it. It was sort of like saying, I'm putting my uh, values and my connection with you above any temporary difficulty that might uh, be ahead of us out of faith that we're going to be able to work it out. So that is a rare value set in a culture where everybody, everything is replaceable and everything like, you know, I don't like uh, how you treat me. I'm going to get me a new one, you know? Um, so we lucked out in that area, or maybe we chose each other to begin with. Mm. Yeah, I love how she put that. That was, uh, that was beautifully put. Yeah, you know, and I think the, the thing about society, which I think there's so many things that we get wrong about our definitions of love and how we apply ours to others and all of that, is that on the outside, people would be like, wow, that's difficult, or there's a level of, of, of polygamy that's going on that could end up into that, you know, a, a weird realm. But at the end of the day, probably the more accurate reality of this is is that it's truly like pushing the definition of love further. It's, it's, it's love on everybody's level, and unfortunately society will label it in different ways. Do, do you see it that way, where this is just kind of pushing and expanding the boundaries of love instead of it being something that's a societal taboo? I agree, yeah. Uh, it's... The way it's just been phrased about putting the negative, putting your values and your love above your temporary feelings 
of discomfort or maybe even anger and jealousy is quite significant, um, period. <clears throat> to be able to include other people who you love into your life, because people approach love as an on and off switch, right? But there's varying degrees of it, and they're all valid and valuable. It's just us being able to take our ego or our own personal needs and wants and putting it before the value or the investment of the relationship. I do feel society is, I mean, society, obviously, this one in particular frowns at it, but I do feel it's changing, right? From where I stand, I could see it changing. I don't think uh, there were would be enough uh, reference or background material. It would have been harder for me to do this had it happened, let's say, 10 or, 10 or 20 years ago. But be, be it as it may, I could, when I talked about it with my husband, I was like, one of the things that came up is that it's a matter of nature too, right? It's having, needing something that is different sexually, needing a different outlet of expression sexually. I, I when we talked about it, I was like, it's not as if I, you're a man and he's a man and I'm choosing him over you. It's as if, uh, uh, you're a man and I'm gay and I want something different and I need something different. And so it's not as if there's any kind of competition between you because there's a need for something that is not on the everyday vocabulary. And he considered that and he, and he thought about it and it did affect how he saw the picture at the time because it's not like a, uh, it's not like just a common affair. Right, it's it speaks to a different set of needs on a sexual level and an, on an identity level. That makes sense, you know. And I think the thing about our society too is such a high divorce rate is that there are so many people out there that do cheat on other people, and it's such a horrible feeling. I know I've been through it myself, and I always think, well, why not get out of it and then do what you want to do? Why would you just sneak behind? And, and do something and then have to confess or get caught or whatever. But it almost seems like with what you're doing is you're, you're being very transparent up front. You still want the love and the relationship, but you still, like you just said, you have other desires. It seems like a much more valorous uh, position to be in. But that's the other thing that's dumb about our society is that they don't view it that way. You know, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't work for me. I know it wouldn't work for me personally. But I know that for others out there, and I guess that's the thing about what you're saying, 10 years ago it would have been a different scenario. And I'm hoping, and I guess to further that thought, is that hopefully I think that we're in a better place. I think that sexuality, transgender, you know, gay and lesbian communities, all of these things are much more ever-present in the younger minds. I mean, I have a 16-year-old stepdaughter at home. I hear the way they talk and think. I think we're in a more evolved place these things to be more acceptable as we move forward? I think it has, it, it creates a better atmosphere, but I have to say it did not start out transparent and it did not start out above, it started out with lying and cheating and hiding and shame and trying to, and trying to cover it and, and telling, you know, just lying, just normal, the kind of cheating that happens when you're, when you're doing something you're ashamed of and, and don't want to don't want to be called out and I would not have been able to overcome that state on my own if there was not a power dynamic involved as in at a certain point of this uh, cheating cheating eats up your soul right like you said cheating is a horrible experience for the cheater too because it really kills you it's it's like it's like waking up every morning and drinking your cup of poison and then going going around sick all day and and it brought me real low, right? It it lasted the period of of being untransparent lasted quite a few months. Uh, it wasn't something I chose to do, as cheaters often don't. It was something I kind of like slipped into, <laughs> kind of like one mistake at a time slipped into, one uh, one uh, loose uh, bra strap at a time slipped into, but. Uh, um, it did begin as an affair, and that affair uh, basically day after day was kind of draining my blood. And when it came to the point where I was considering suicide, I walked up to Joshua and said, listen, I, 
need help. <laughs> I, I know we're doing the, I know I, I can't get out of it. I'm stuck. I'm, I can't tell my husband because I'm afraid of losing my kids. And I can't uh, live this way. And, uh, and he said, we have to tell your husband the truth. And he, I said, I'm scared. Let me jump. Let me jump on that. All right. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. My name is Joshua. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a professional dominant, a.k.a. like a male mistress based in New York City. Uh, I've been doing professional domination for about a decade. And uh, when I met Slave Karma, he was coming to a roundtable discussion that I was hosting with my then partner around BDSM and religion and the crossroads of them. Uh, she showed up late, <laughs> but um, when she when she showed up, she had such amazement in her eyes, like you could tell this was really capturing her curiosity. And we connected over uh, over time with that. When doing professional domination and having lived this lifestyle for a period of time and seeing the healing elements of it, the bonding elements of this lifestyle, any opportunity I get to put it in front of folks, especially mainstream media, is, an, is a win for me because I want people to see the opportunities from this journey. So when I met Karma, I took her under my wing to walk her through what this journey is because I wanted her to have a clear understanding of what this is, especially as a reporter. Knowing she was married, the initial intention was to help her learn these skills so that she can take them home and engage in this on her own time. In that same time, I was going through accusations of the Me Too movement, and none of it was true. The hard part is when you're accused of it, no one listens to you, no one gives you space, because as an event producer, which I've been hosting events for just as long, uh, when I get someone who comes to me with an accusation, I hold space for the victim, and I believe what they're telling me, but I also have responsibility of talking to the accused. And when that happened to me, no one was listening to me. And it's very gut-wrenching when your character is questioned, when you've built your whole reputation on trust and integrity, and then someone can come in and make an accusation and everyone just shuts their walls. And karma was the only one who was giving me space to talk. So as I opened my doors to her and let her see who I was and learn about my history and the truths and untruths about what was being said, I connected with her because she was a safe space for me to talk. And that's how my emotions developed for her is from a person of safety when no one else was opening their doors for me. Um, as it progressed, it was one, as karma said, it was one, we'll call it one lie at a time, <laughs> right? To where I have to stay out late for work or I'm doing this interview. And she navigated it however she did. My role in this is I tried to circumvent morals with ethics, meaning I only needed her consent in order to engage with her. But morally, truthfully, I needed to know that everyone was on board for it. And I allowed her to take the weight of that responsibility as opposed to pushing through it to making sure that it was covered. So I got selfish in that. And in that time, also her not really trusting me to the degree that if we're going to be in a relationship, there has to be a level of trust for me to engage with you. And that wasn't present until we got to the very end where things were very self-destructive and very negative. And it was in order for me to step up to the plate and be able to take responsibility, I needed to know that she would follow my direction without hesitation. Now, without hesitation it sounds pretty, but it's not, it's not an easy task. And we had to really work out what trust meant between us. And when I laid it out to her, in order for us to move forward, in order for me to take a step into responsibility, the first thing you need to do is tell your husband. And that was, <laughs> that was kicking the door open to a whole life of change. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty clear cut before and after. It was a definite before and after moment. Because before I was, uh, I was a lying cheater who was having an affair with a man who I think didn't really care about me, who had a lot of other women, and who uh, seemed to find time to me for me on a random basis. Who nonetheless, I was crazily in love with, but I blamed myself and really did not like myself for being in love with him because I, I didn't think 
it was mutual, uh, to a point where I have a staff to lean on, right? A leader and a staff to lean on. I'm like, I don't know what to do. He's like, I can t- tell me what you want. I tell him what I want. And then he's like, what do you need to do to get there? And I tell him what I need to do <laughs> to get there. And then he's like, okay, so do it. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't do it. And he says, I command you. <laughs> and then I do it. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't think I can do it, but I did it. And that's how it started. And, that how, and that's how it continued from the first hardest and most horrible start of it, of telling the truth to my husband, which was uh, a terrifying moment and very difficult for all of us. Understanding that at any moment, if and when, uh, if her husband decides that he wants this relationship to end, it's his right to make that decision uh, up until this day. Because at the end of the day, my goal and intention with karma is to make her the best human, the best mother and wife possible by learning who she is and being able to speak her truth and what she wants out of life. We worked it out. That is, telling my husband the truth came with the, came with the possibility of him saying, you have to stop seeing Joshua, which I... Joshua and I, my master and I, Master Joshua and I, negotiated the whole thing between us first, right? We had these series of practice conversations in which we asked each other, so what is it that you want? What is it that you're willing to accept? What is it that you will give up on? And what is it that you can't give up on? And what are your moral responsibilities and rights? So after talking a lot between us, I reached the, the understanding that when presenting this issue to my husband, it's my moral duty to say, if you want me to end this relationship, I will end it. But it's also my moral duty to say, I don't think monogamy is the, <laughs> is the start all and end all of relationships. And, I, and now that I am broke it, I don't think I can go back into that cage. <laughs> uh, luckily, so- my husband felt marriage should not be a cage either. So of all the aliases that you could have picked, you picked Karma. Why? Why was that the name? <laughs> good one. Good one. Good one. <laughs> Can I God that? damn it. Yeah, no, no, yeah, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, first it started from a, uh, a certain line in the book, when uh, a certain thing that happened in the book. Karma is a motif that, that keeps popping back up in, in, in the book. And the first time it comes up is when uh, Master Joshua asked me if I would, I was following the story uh, about, his accus- about the accusations against him of sexual abuse. And I asked him, he wasn't sure at that point if, if how he felt about me involving him, him or the, his partner in a, in, in a story that followed that. His partner was leaning against it at the time. And he asked me if I, he asked me, to be easy with him on that. Like he asked for my respect, not to involve his kids, not to involve his family and so on. And I said, okay, but I said, how would you open a door to a reporter when you have this cloud of shit like publicly hanging over your head in a place where anyone can find it? And he was uh, like, uh, I trust karma to protect me. And I was like, it's not karma protecting you, it's me. <laughs> So that's the first place where reading that line, I was like, hmm, karma is a good name. Because also the whole book is sort of revolves about the concept of karma. Because somehow it feels, in my own personal stories, I made mistakes. And I, was, and I paid for them. And I could see the payment of the mistake as an equal to the sins I made. For every lie I told, I paid the price. And <coughs> that seems right to me. That seems, uh, that, that comforts me. The fact that I paid a price for being a bad person is something very comforting for me and very reassuring. It's because it shows me that there is logic to the world. And so karma is, is the underlying force that drives this story. And uh, that's why I picked it as a name. And uh, I went with uh, Karma Said as my uh, author 
name because of all the memes that are out there saying that, that if you Google the meme Karma said, you'll come up with a bunch of brilliant things that all of them apply to the book. <laughs> you know, you talked about how hard it was, you know, not with your husband not knowing and, and being in an affair, so to speak. Is this book a way of helping people find out who they are prior to getting in that position you were in? Is this kind of a cathartic venture for you and something to help other people realize before they get to that point? Absolutely, but it's also, if you got to that point, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean the end. It might be, I think if I would ask something, if I, if I have hopes for this book in, in this situation, if I hope, if, what my hope is for the book is that people who read it would be like, be the outcome what it may, I have to say the truth because this is killing me. If it speaks to anybody, I would like it to speak for, to the cheaters because uh, those who don't cheat, good for you. <laughs> those who never cheated, good for you. Uh, it doesn't warn people to stop before they cheat because uh, the outcome in the end was positive. But it does ask people to say, throughout the whole book, just pick your truth. Just go with what is true for you because the lying is, is I touch the iron, right? I know how it feels. It, it, it corrodes your soul. And telling the truth is just the way out of it, out of anything. And you pay the price, and you, and you do the crime, you pay the price, and you're a better person for having spoken the truth. Whether the price was super high or whether you get lucky like me and the price is, uh, is, is not that high. What has been the best fan letter that you've gotten or best response from the book? One of the best responses was uh, this book showed me you don't it was a review not a fan letter because uh i don't know i get reviews i don't get fan letters and and the, the best review that i was got it was, it was said that karma takes you by the hand and she walks you through through her time of darkness and when it's dark for you you don't have to walk alone she shows you what despair feels like and and she shows you there's a light on the other side of it like one of the most touching ones. So as far as your life as a journalist, are you still, is there, you know, and I know myself because I, I'm one myself. It's almost like getting a tattoo. You just keep getting them. Is there, are you still doing journalism along with being an author? How, how has that, how has that changed for you? You know, your job as a journalist, does it still exist? Uh, well, at the time, I was working for a conservative outlet. Of course, I can no longer do that in good faith. <laughs> um, I do not write under my real name anymore. And now what I write about nowadays, I write for uh, the sexually alternative community, and uh, my topics revolve around that uh, because it's uh, more interesting to me than conservative politics at the moment. <laughs> what if you tell what you're thinking about now? <laughs> uh, so, right <laughs> Right now, I am writing, uh, I, I write stories basically about our life together right now. Uh, and uh, one, the, the story I just submitted is called uh, Polycule Politics, about um, the tensions and responsibilities and conflict and comfort and all the various aspects of life with family and kids and a master, and a master's other paramours, and how the, it all interacts, and what happens when one party needs to move away. Uh, so that is that is kind of like uh, my ballpark now, my my field now. So it's I'm going to ask find publics for that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask each of you respectively a question here, and it's going to be really a matter of brevity, and I'm going to kind of paint a picture here. So, and, and I'm going to kind of come from my jazz background. Miles Davis was notorious for sometimes towards the late part of his career. He would get on stage. All these people paid money. Everybody's in the crowd. Everybody's waiting. And he would get up, and he would play one note, and he would leave. And, you know, there's probably people that were there that were fine with it. They got to see him. And it was a statement of its own. So I'm asking each of you respectively, if you take your book, and your story, 
and what's happened up to this point, and you could give anybody out there a piece of advice, the best advice, based on what you two have experienced together for somebody out there that wants to live their best life, what would be your liner? What would be your one trumpet blast if you got on stage to let somebody know? Because obviously that would be a precursor to them getting the full show, which is your book. So what is your one line to those out there listening? <clears throat> That's a complicated one liner, right? <clears throat> because they would have yeah. to be able to process what I'm going to say. <laughs> Do what's natural, not what's normal. But they would have to be willing to sit with that and ask themselves, well, what is my natural state? What is my truth as opposed to what's expected of me? Yeah. If they can achieve that, their whole life will turn around. But that's just impossible. It's nearly impossible, right? Because no one taught us how to do that. My liner would be, uh, go with the truth. It's worth the struggle. Thank you. Joshua Carmen. Thank you for, for taking time out today to talk about the book, to talk about your lives. This has been fascinating. Um, so I want to give you the pulpit right now. If there's anything that I didn't cover that you want to add, how anybody out there can find out about the book, and anything else applicable that's related to you know, your world and what you would like the public to consume. Thank you. Uh... You can find the book on, the book is called Surviving Master Joshua, The BDSM Memoir of an Unfaithful Wife by Karma Stead. You can find it best by Googling it and and choosing your favorite uh, purveyor. Uh, It's on Amazon. It's also on many other places. Uh, And, or you can order it through survivingmasterjoshua.com. And uh, that would be it for me. And for myself, you can find me under masterjoshua.com, kinkcollective.net, that's K-I-N-K collective.net. Also, ssdce.org, which stands for Sanctuary for Spiritual Development and Consciousness Expansion. You can find me on all social media platforms under Master Joshua NYC. And anyone that listens to this, if you're curious about is BDSM for you, I provide free 30-minute consultations just to talk about it, uh, to open these doors and make this lifestyle accessible. Well, I can tell you too right now, this is probably one of the more unique interviews that I've done, and I've really appreciated the fact that you've presented this story and that I've had the opportunity to, you know, be a small part of this narrative to get it out there. So thank you for, you know, I, I think I think the thing that I get from all of this is that human beings need to be better about bravery. And I think that if we all can find a way to do that, with you putting your story out there and living the life that you want to live, I think we'd all be in a much better place. I think that's the best uh, review <laughs> anybody gave me. Thank you. Yeah, bravery. Bravery is, is a big thing. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, and music around the globe. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.